Good morning. What a way to begin the day, the week, the month. The month tomorrow. I know. <laughs> As we gather this morning, know this. We welcome you all, visitor, guest, member, friend, everyone who comes with an open heart and goodwill. We are glad, glad to have you. I'm Vanessa Cowie. I'm your worship associate this morning. I'll begin with a few announcements, reminders. I'm going to keep them short because we have a wonderful program planned for you today. Um, I remind you to sign up for Circle Dinners, either to host or to attend, to enjoy fellowship and sistership and siblingship and to get to know each other better. Uh, you still have time to register for our UUTC retreat at the mountain. I think the early registration period is over, but um, don't let that stop you from uh, registering. It's our UU Conference Center in Highlands, and again, that will be a wonderful weekend. It's September 9th through 11th, as you no doubt saw on the slides. <clears throat> And just this morning, I learned of another wonderful opportunity at the mountain. Terry Ashley. Terry, would you mind rising or so everyone can see who you are? Because I'm going to go over just the details of this invitation. And Terry will be available to talk with you if you have questions. And there will be details on all of these uh, events in the newsletter. So please seek those out. Terry. And I say in celebration of your 80th birthday, Terry commissioned a musical piece by composer Amber Ferenc, and it's inspired by the White Oak Groves at the Mountain. It will premiere on August 12th at 3 p.m. at the Mountain. The piece is called Ode to the Grove, and uh, I am hereby on Terry's behalf inviting you to that. Uh, please do uh, seek her out and watch the newsletter for more details on that event. And please, today stay for coffee hour after the service. If you're concerned about removing your mask to consume food and beverage, um, it's a beautiful day outdoors today too, so that's another option for you. I want to say I'm grateful for all who are participating in today's service, our audiovisual technicians, Catherine Burley and Doug Wilkes, and they have some special things planned along with our speaker Royce for today. Also, our musicians, John Austin and Mark Wingate, whom you just heard from and you'll hear from again. I'd like to recognize that our pastor, our minister, Reverend Bob Rangelian, is here with us in the sanctuary today, along with his wife, Christy. And I want to recognize that Krista Moore will be part of today's service, who will have readings before the, uh, the message. And last, but most certainly not least, our guest speaker, Royce Zia. For almost three years during World War II, Royce's parents were on the run from Japanese soldiers in China, much like many Ukrainians today, or the Yazidis almost a decade ago, or imagine anywhere in the world where families might be fleeing from war and persecution. Royce was born in the middle of his parents' arduous journey, in the middle of nowhere, to use his words. After the war, the family moved from place to place within China. In 1949, they barely escaped from China just before the communist leadership closed the borders. And they settled in Hong Kong, the place where Royce would say he grew up. In 1958, the family immigrated to the United States. For the next decade, Royce went to high school, college, graduate school, completing degrees in mathematics and physics. Over the next eight years, Royce worked as a postdoc, first in Geneva, Switzerland, and then in England, where he met and married Jenny. Welcome, Jenny. From 1976 to 2010, he taught at Virginia Tech and relocated to Brevard four years ago. And I am so lucky 
that we relocated just opposite across the street from him. <laughs> Royce's parents were Christian academics. He inherited his father's philosophical genes while his mother nurtured his interests in music, art, poetry, and physics. Now retired, he enjoys the freedom from the confines of physics and mathematics to wander around in other arenas of human endeavors. Those who know Royce will know he likes to tease, and today that shows up as his message, playing the violin with one hand. We begin our service with the lighting of our chalice, a symbol of Unitarian Universalism. And with words from the Canadian UU Francis Cozier, a chalice lighting for the dark and the light. May we light this chalice this morning to remind us of the power and beauty of balance and contrast. It is darkness that can make the flame of a single candle so powerful and light that deepens those shadows in turn. A chalice flame is the meeting point, the union of the refuge, safety, and incredible beauty of darkness. And the warmth, the assurance, and the joy of light. May this act of lighting our chalice remind us that we are stronger together in all the complexities and the disagreements of relationship because we are different and because we are one. Please stand in body or in, in spirit to sing our opening hymn number 23, Bring Many Names.
And let me just own that mistake in the order of service. That's what you call copy and paste. Royce has wisdom words for all ages. Uh, is this working? Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for um, that introduction. And I was supposed to say a few words for the young people in the audience when it's over there. And you can see already on the uh, service that the thing I'll be talking about is this book. I don't know whether you've seen it, but probably most of you know this book, right? I say anybody who doesn't know The Phantom Tobook. Oh, I highly recommend it, but as you can see, many people do. All right, let me begin. Once upon a time, there's a little kid named Milo. There you are, there. And like many kids of his age, he's not quite uh, sure what he wants to do with himself. And so he's bored with everything. He's bored with school and so on and so forth. He's not uh, like nowadays where you can play video games. So one day he came home and he was, uh, had a couple of hours and he didn't know what to do and he was very discouraged and suddenly he discovered a big package waiting for him and, and he you know, went over and opened it and wondered what it was and found that it was uh, a little car, a tow booth, and an imitation. Well, most of you probably don't know what a tow booth is, but uh, there is uh, there is one at the entrance to the um, to the um, uh, arboretum, and there's Milo in his little car, and so he decided to just go ahead and see what happens. Well, um, he wound up immediately in the doldrums, and he fell asleep. So he would have been lost all his adventure if it weren't for the fact that he, a, a dog named Talk came along. Talk is in TikTok. And here he is. Uh, you see, he's the watchdog. So he come along and woke him up, and they became very good friends and went on a journey together. Well, it's a very, very long story, as you can see. And they got into um, um, some trouble right away because they went to a city, and there were people there. And their main business is trading words and eating them. and um, Anyway, they got in trouble and they got thrown into jail. There was a witch there, supposedly. They were a bit scared, and so, but they nevertheless met the witch and they discovered, oh, she's actually quite nice. And she said, my name is not witch. They got it wrong. My name is actually witch, like that. And I got put in jail because I keep telling them which is the right word to use and which is the wrong word to use. And they didn't like that. Anyway. Um, from which uh, Milo and company learned the story of the land, which is that it began as the land of now, uh, all the stuff on the left here, and there was nothing except monsters and so on and so forth, and uh, a young prince came along, sailing from the sea of knowledge, landed here in the little island in the middle, and built himself a city called the City of Wisdom. And he grew to be a very nice king. He had a family with two little boys whom he liked very much and taught everything. He was a little bit disappointed that he didn't have any girls like you. And um, so he went on. But he discovered that a couple of girls were abandoned in a basket. And he was overjoyed and brought them home and brought them up as princesses and named them Rhyme and Reason. Anyway. Uh, eventually he died and the boys grew up and one went south and one went north. The one that went south uh, built a city called Dictionopolis and he called himself King Azaz. And the other one um, went north building a city called Digitopolis and he's called a mathematician. And there he is, you see? And the main business over in Dictionopolis is to mine numbers. Anyway, um, while their separate kingdoms grew and prospered, the two kings got into a fight with each other, and they got, the battles got worse and worse. So eventually, one day, the, the king Asas says, oh no, words are much more important than numbers. And the mathematician says, oh no, it's the other way around. And the battles got worse, and eventually, they decided to call the princess to decide you know, who's better. Princess went away and decided for a long time and came back and says, oh, actually, they're both equally important. It's just as important 
to count the sand as to name the stars. And everybody was happy except the two brothers. And they kept, they were so mad that they banished the princess and sent them off the castle in the air. You see, way up on the top, there's a castle in the air in the corner, beyond the mountains of ignorance. And so the witch then basically, a witch said to Milo, and the way for you to bring back rhyme, the uh, peace to this land is to go and get those, rescue those princess and bring them back. So the rest of the story is about them going through all kinds of things, the forest and so on, and bring back rhyme and reason. Well, there's a happy ending. They did bring back the princess, and everything is uh, fine. So I hope you enjoy that. <laughs> and this book is available in the library, two copies. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Royce. Thank you for Phantom Toll Booth. Well, this morning, you were invited to light a candle representing a deeply felt joy or sorrow a ritual that we have observed here for a long time. Um, and, and you may not have shared uh, a joy or sorrow formally, but you may have done so informally in conversation. Uh, if there's anyone who feels that uh, you were left out and would like to have us light a candle for you now, please indicate. So, and I'll repeat your words into the microphone. All right. Well, I'm going to light a, a candle representing our collective joy and sorrow. And I just let one as a symbol recognizing that our joys and sorrows are intertwined. By, by all that we hold sacred, may we honor what has been shared in this place and time and in the chat online. And may we hold these joys and sorrows of our friends and neighbors and ourselves in our hearts. And let's pause for a moment of silence to reflect on all of these emotions and in our heart and spirit and hold them within our community and in our human community. And I'll ring the time of silence in and out. As the ushers circulate the baskets, 
Remember that these walls, these lights, these tapestries, this music, our coffee that's being prepared for us, the chairs supporting us, they all came from financial support from you yourselves or those who came before you, came before us. Likewise, on this last day of July, it's the last chance to get in a charitable donation for our partner for this month, well, actually our own Dignity Project. And as the baskets go around also, please notice the offertory music. It's a piece by Bach that Royce asked Mark and John to play this morning, and it's one of the pieces that was chosen for the golden record that's being carried even now aboard Voyager 1 beyond our solar system. Carl Sagan, who chaired the committee that chose the music and audio for the golden record, said the launching of this bottle into the cosmic ocean says something very hopeful about life on this planet. And know that all of your gifts are received with much gratitude. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm Krista. Um, and Royce has chosen four quotes to prime our thinking for his talk. The first is from the existential philosopher, Martin Buber. A human being becomes whole, not in virtue of relation to himself only, but rather in virtue of an authentic relation to another human being. When people come to you for help, do not turn them off with pious words saying, have faith and take your troubles to God. Act instead as though there were, there were no God, as though there were only one person in the world who could help, only yourself. The next quote is from Michael Pollan, who you may know from books like um, The Botany of Desire and The Omnivore's Dilemma. So, I realized the opposite of spiritual was not material. The opposite of spiritual was egotistical thinking, that it was the ego that separates us, whether it's from nature, it's the ego that allows us to objectify the other. And that other might be the natural world, but it could also be other people. Many of us objectify other people, and so that became how I came to understand spiritual experience. It's deep connection, and it might be with God for some people, but for me, it's with nature, it's with music. It's with all these things that I merged with 
when the barrier came down. The third one is from Natalie Battaglia, who's an astrophysicist. It took 13.7 billion years for the atoms to come together to create the portal to the universe, which is my physical self. I don't know what me is. I just feel part of everything, and I feel such deep gratitude for being able to take the connections to take the, oh, sorry, for being able to take the conscious look at the universe, at myself as being part of the universe. And lastly, from Carl Sagan from The Pale Blue Dot. Consider again the dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. To my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceit than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thanks, Royce. Is it working? Great. Um, those are very thoughtful words. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Vanessa for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I don't normally do this kind of thing, so I hope it will go OK. Um, I want to thank Reverend Bob for sharing this uh, space and time with me. And um, I want to thank uh, Mark and John for doing this beautiful music. Uh, actually, given the title of the talk, I asked them to play the violin on one hand, and they absolutely refused. They said that's impossible. So I said, hey, wait a minute, uh, you guys walk on water, so what's the problem? And they said, well, the problem is you're asking us to walk on thin air. So <laughs> anyway, the other person I really want to thank is uh, Catherine back there. You saw that beautiful video. She made that. Uh, she might be able to put it on the web somewhere that it keeps going from there. It just got to Jupiter and we keep going from there. And anyway, it's very symbolic of the uh, serious topic of this talk, which is the science and religion divide. Uh, my laptop doesn't talk to this AV system. And it took the heroic efforts of Catherine to get them to talk to each other. So you would actually be seeing something up here. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are some problems with the colors. But uh, Catherine is absolutely amazing in being able to coax uh, two different groups together. We, I think we should send her to the UN. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as you heard, I'm a physicist, and we give talks. We don't give sermons. And uh, the difference is that a talk is really a glorified show and tell. You know, when you go in there and say, hey, mom, look what I found in the creek. Um, so. The way we do it is we show them with a lot of slides. So you can see a lot of slides up here. And you would see, basically, that it's nothing more than um, a color version of a caption. Think of it as a closed caption. So you don't have to hear me. You can just see some of the words up there. Anyway, unfortunately, the, the, um, uh, as if it is uh, the, um, the uh, systems don't talk to each other, that the colors are not that great. There's actually blue and red. And if you don't like the colors back there, you're welcome to turn around and look that way. That's a much, much better screen back there. <laughs> and there'll be a much more colorful projections. And in particular, there'll be blue arrows and red arrows and so on. And uh, um, I hope you would enjoy that. Anyway, so playing the violin with one hand. Oh, as Vanessa told you already, I like to tease, and it's a teaser. And think of it as a meal that we're having. This is not just an appetizer, OK? And so how well can you make music with, on the violin with just one hand, or indeed many other instruments? Well, I, when I tried to Google this on the, online, I got two real answers. One is Isaac Stern on Wikipedia. There you see him playing just with the right hand. And then another one, just two of them, 
is this uh, lady, a young girl, more recently, playing with just the left hand. Um, needless to say, the sounds are not fantastic. So <laughs> she was uh, with some other musical instruments. John and Colleen's forte is the piano forte. Probably the most well-known is Ravel's concerto for the left hand. And here you are with uh, Ravel, and, and you can click up the video. And what happened is that Paul Wittgenstein had uh, lost his right arm during World War I and decided to commission a piano concerto. And there he is playing with the left hand. Now, for those of you who are familiar with music, this is what the opening bars look like for the piano. And uh, I don't know about John and Colleen, but I can't play this with two hands, let alone one hand. So let me go on to another instrument, the French horn. French horn, in principle, one hand is enough to play. Actually, even the horn itself is not necessary. Here is uh, Dennis Brain playing Mozart's horn concerto on a garden hose. So there we are. The point of this teaser is that while making music with one hand is possible, and often heroically so, it's surely better to do with both. And so the conclusion is you can't really make beautiful music uh, on a violin if your right hand were to denigrate your left hand or vice versa. And Certainly, it doesn't make sense for words to denigrate numbers, just like King Azaz and Mathematician and so on. So the conclusion is, if you can't make beautiful music like that, and you'd rather let both hands play on the violin, then wouldn't you be better off letting both your mind and your spirit play together? And if you don't like mind and spirit and you're more materialistic, you can call it the brain and the, um, and, and the heart instead. OK, so this leads me to the main course and a much more boring title of the talk, which is Bridging the Science-Religion Divide. <laughs> anyway, too often I've heard folks on both sides denigrate those on the other. So here's a Pope denigrating um, uh, Galileo and calling him heretical. Actually, in that case, it's more than denigrate, it's prosecute, right? So here's a more recent example. Love cannot be explained by science and God is love. So it goes the other way, too. Here's a, those of you who are my age would probably remember the uh, first man sent into space is supposed to have said, I see no God up here. Well, it turned out that Gagarin never said that. He turned out to be quite a religious fellow, and is Kutrev who said that. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure you've heard of God of the Gaps. After all, nowadays, who needs Helios and Surya? These Helios and Surya are these gods that you know, ride on huge horses, and they move the sun around every day. And indeed, nowadays, we ridicule those who rely on prayers rather than vaccines to avert measles, polio, or COVID-19. But such attitude and behavior really makes no sense in, the, in no more than the right hand belittling the left when you're trying to play the violin. Or for numbers to laugh at words, for that matter, right? After all, what would you say if a carbon atom were to laugh at a gold atom for not being able to support life? And what about hummingbirds sneering a box turtle for not being able to hover? And what about a chainsaw denigrating a hammer for not being able to clear a downed tree? Or a cardiac surgeon who puts down a 747 pilot for her incompetence in performing open heart surgery? How about Beethoven laughing at Einstein's ability to compose a symphony or Einstein belittling Mother Teresa's capacity to appreciate quantum mechanics? None of this makes sense, yes? And none of this makes sense partly because of major misunderstandings of what something or another is meant to be or what something or another is trained to be or designed to be or set out to be. And to me, then, this is the, at the root of the science-religion standoff, is that there is a major misunderstanding on both sides as to what they are supposed to be. So let me share my thoughts about this major misunderstanding. So what is the goal of science and what, is, what science is not, or for that matter, what is religion and what is the goal and what it's not? Let me say the obvious first, at least to this audience, Science and religion is not technology, and religion is not believing in God. But more importantly, it is not the dogmas that are imposed on you by institutions. And indeed, here's Paul Tillich saying, every institution is inherently demonic. That's his favorite word, demonic. And so let me turn to the 
positive part, what is the goal of science and religion? Let me call on the help of Bernard Lonergan. Uh, he is a theologian, the only one who I know who fully understands Einstein's theory of relativity. In fact, better than 98% of the <laughs> physics texts that I know. And anyway, here he is. And uh, of the many books he wrote, one of them is called Insight, a study of human understanding. And just for the fun of it, let me show you the table of contents. Uh, you will find here chapter five, space and time, and so on. Sorry, that went by too fast. I haven't learned how to tap this yet. But it says space, time, and rods and clocks, and physics, and so on and so forth in a theology book. Anyway, the um, uh, main point that you want to make about his study of the insight, is that there are three-step process. And the first step is observations, namely your direct experience. And then the next step is making connections. If you like, trying to make sense of what you have just seen, trying to make meaning, trying to make model, and so on and so forth. It's not just theologians that do this. Good physicists actually say this, too. Here's Niels Bohr. He is one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. And he, there he is, chewing the cut with Einstein. And the thing that he said, uh, which is relevant here, is in our description of nature, the purpose is not to disclose the real essence of this phenomenon, but only to track down, as far as possible, the relations between our experience. So we experience nature, and we try to connect the dots. That's what physics is. Okay? So <laughs> physics is not about our understanding of nature. So to come back, the third step is verification. Once you make these thoughts, you're going to try to say, are they OK or not OK, you know, and so on. So it's an ongoing process, looping over these three steps. And so if you like, it's a, really a dance between doubt and certainty. Okay? So let me make a detour to illustrate with a couple of examples. You go and you see a bunch of stars at night. And you connect the dots and say, hey, there's a line up there. And well, nowadays we say, hey, that's a nice story for kids, or perhaps nice income for uh, astrologers. Here's another set of observations. You see apples fall, and you see the phases of the moon. And somebody wants to tell you, oh, there's a connection between them. You want to make a connection? Surely you're joking. Phases of the moon and the apple falling? But there we are. This fellow tells you how to do that. And the verification? Well, it works, and we got to the moon and back, right? And of course, it doesn't stop there. Here comes this fellow who sticks his tongue out at him and says, hey, wait, Isaac, you missed some dots, OK? So it's an ongoing process. Coming back to the talk, to me, then, science is the endeavor to gain insight to these three steps into the physical realm. And now. In the physical realm, we have a much wider spectrum from our direct experience. Let me give you an example. If you just talk about distances, we can feel not much less than a tenth of the width of the hair, or for that matter, at the distance of a marathon. You might be able to get a plane, but you're feeling really the plane or, or a car or what have you. But if you use instruments, you can go 100 million million times smaller or 100 billion billion times further. Okay, that's the distance you go. So turning to religion, then, to me, is the endeavor to gain insight, to go through these three steps about the non-physical realm. And you might want to call it the spiritual realm, if you want. What is this realm? This is a realm of human experiences that span a huge gamut of things that is vital for us beyond just food and shelter. Let me give you an example. Purpose, meaning, inspiration. Peace, grace, gratitude, transcendence, uh, depression, resilience, and all of these things, OK? To use Ernie Mills' words from a, a month ago, all wonder the numinous experience. In all of these experiences, we go through the same three things. We try to make sense. If you see a bush that is burning but not being consumed, what the heck does that mean? You know, and you try to make some connections, and you try to do something about it. And that's the third step. And where does it get you, and so on? Well, into a lot of trouble, actually. But <laughs> anyway, that is also, of course, a dance. And this time, the dance is called the dance between faith and doubt. 
So to the extent that these endeavors is something that each of us engage in, one is an exploration of the external world. The color code is blue here. And the other one is the journey for the in internal world. The color code is red there, OK, one or the other. So both of us give better knowledge, one about our environment and the other one about oneself. So I can draw it this way. There you are in the middle, and there are these two worlds. And the external world, as we know, we live in three plus one dimensions. But there's actually a lot more. And uh, we don't really know. The string theorists would tell you 10 dimensions, 11 or 26 dimensions. In any case, we know a little bit about those things, quite a bit, in fact. By contrast, the internal world, I have no idea how many dimensions there are. And all we have is smatterings of his things here and there. OK, let me turn to all the endeavor collectively from all of us together. So for the external world, we better at least agree on the observations. right? Did you see a star or didn't you see a star? When you see that rock getting pushed off the uh, cliff, did it go down or did it fly off like an eagle? You better agree if you're going to talk to each other about such things. So in that sense, we use the word for the goals of science, it's being objective, is to be ideal. Now, it's impossible for anybody to observe something without being affecting what is being observed. On the other hand, the opposite to impose the values of what you're the observer on the observed is going to give you biased data about nature. So one frequent put down of scientists is to stereotype their objectivity. But to me, that's a complete misunderstanding, no more than saying, hey, 173 is a number it can't read or write. And more importantly, I would distinguish to be objective and to objectify, a word that came up earlier in the reading. And to be objective is to clear one's mind from prejudices. And to objectify is to impose your desire on the person that is being observed. So let me make a little detour on love, this topic that we like, and of uh, being objective, which is really a, a scientific term. Uh, this is a book that I read when I was a graduate student and made um, a huge uh, impression on me. Eric Fromm talks about four elements of love. It's actually four layers. One is on top of the other. Care is easy for how you care for somebody. Responsibility is not duty, but rather the ability to respond. Can you respond to somebody's call for things? Respect is the next one, which is not um, you know, saluting somebody, but whether uh, you can actually see somebody to look at somebody in their own individuality. The bottom one is knowledge. And here's from saying, to respect a person is not possible without knowing him. Care and responsibility would be blind if they were not guided by knowledge. And knowledge is possible only when I transcend the concern for myself and see the other person in his own terms. So this is, echoes what Paul Tillich says, the first duty of love is to listen. And that is what I mean by objective knowledge. You want to take yourself out of your own self and look at the other person as it is. So let me give you an example. Here is a commandment that we all grew up with. So to, it's a rather problematic. Without knowledge, in particular, if you love blue cheese and your neighbor just arrived from China. This is not a joke <laughs> in the sense that I have a good friend who just arrived at Columbia to start his undergraduate studies. And his roommate insists that he share blue cheese with him. And he was sick for two days after that. <laughs> so let me come back to where I was. So I'm uh, talking about being objective. I made a detour about what objective means. It's talking about observations. So let's go on to the other two levels of insight, making sense. So we don't have to agree on how we connect the dots about nature. You all have different descriptions. To construct this mental picture is necessarily biased, but the ultimate judge is not you or me, but nature. Nature would come along and tell you, hey, guess what? I'm not like what you think. So let's turn to the internal worlds. If we're going to do this collectively, this, this endeavor, the best thing you do is to celebrate the di diversity, because our internal worlds would be necessarily different. We're not seeing the same stars. 
we don't all see burning bushes. There's nothing objective about the direct, direct experience, and both that and the connecting of the dots would be different. And so it is best if we rejoice this diversity by honoring the other people's insights and learning from them what they have learned. So let me go back to this picture of the internal and external worlds. Unfortunately, we only live in three dimensions rather than a million or whatever more. So let me just draw two plus one of these arrows for, the fun, for, for, for ease. So if me is like that, then he would be the others. And I purposely give them different colors so that you, to remind you, they're all different. And so in particular, just to remind you, each strand might as well be infinite dimensional, okay? So this is a very simplistic picture. And so we share the same physical plane, but we bring very different spiritual strands. And it's that same way I say it again, celebrate both the unity of the external world and the diversity of the internal ones. So it makes no sense for a preacher to belittle sign for its lack of love, or for the scientists to laugh at the preacher's love of God. No more than for the left hand to belittle the right hand when you're playing the violin, that it can't create all those notes, and for the right hand to belittle the left hand for saying, hey, you can't make those big sounds like I can. All right, so for us to develop insight into our whole being, it's essential to be engaged on these two fronts, and to live fully is essential to be that the mind and the spirit play together and just like the violin player makes beautiful music by letting both hands play. Okay, that's all well and good the talking. How do you go about doing this? So this brings me to the next course and the next part of my talk. You might call this the salad or cheese course. And that is a term that I've made up. It's called collaborative opposition. I tried to find it on, online and I couldn't find anything that looks like this. And uh, you see the subtitle is a manifestation of what I call balance and harmony. Okay, the word opposition usually elicits the notion of big fights, butting heads, and so on and so forth. And in particular, these uh, blue and red arrows, uh, uh, blue and red arrow, arrows coming from opposite directions. Yet, collaborative opposition is ubiquitous and is absolutely crucial for our lives. Let me give you an example from what I saw last winter when it was very cold. I saw this picture on one of the newsletters. And it's really nice because it was cold and you know that picture warms my heart. And look, can you see what you see? There are two hands coming from opposite directions to bring that coffee into your mouth, right? And beyond that, as you well know, the opposable thumb is a very important part of uh, our species. Beyond that, the tools that we make. And then there's the teeth. If they don't come together and bite on their food, you're in trouble, and plants and animals. Let me go down in level, go down to the cellular level. It's a frightening looking thing as a cell. Now cells make proteins to do what you need. What are proteins? Well, one of them is hemoglobin to carry oxygen all around for you, right? So how do they make it? Well, what happens is that there are two pieces like that that come together to form a ribosome, and the ribosome then clamps on, you see the blue and red arrows, onto an mRNA. By now you all know what an mRNA is, right? To read the code, to make the protein, to make that antibody for your, for your cells to, uh, to fight the COVID. Let's go in the opposite direction. Far away from us, a binary star system is held together by opposing forces. For that matter, everything in our solar system, and we bring up this little fellow again, he says, to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's what's bringing it together. Coming back down to our level, when you clap your hands, you need to be, have collaborative opposition. And for a good hug, like those one that R.K. gives, you need, to, you need to pull in opposite directions, right? So to me then, these two things, being pursuits on these two paths, may look very different and very opposite. Yet they both elicit wonder, humility, and gratitude, like when you see all these galaxies very, very far away. It is up to us to bring these two very different things together into collaborative opposition. So in a similar vein, if we talk about two people coming together, 
then this notion is echoes the um, uh, Carter Haywood's term mutuality, where she was talking about that here uh, some time ago. And similarly, Martin Buber's uh, phrase, I and thou. So I hope you have survived the main course. Let us have some fun with dessert. A dessert begins with order of the elephant. There's the elephant. Say, what the hell is this? <laughs> and, uh, if you are in England and you get an honor and you get knighted, you get into the order of the British Empire. But if you're in Denmark and you get knighted, you go into the order of the elephant. And there you have Copenhagen. and north of Copenhagen is a little town called Hilleward, and there's a palace. And here's a view of the palace, and there is the uh, palace uh, from, a, from a satellite view, and you are across the lake looking at it. And if you cross the lake and go to the main square, you will see this beautiful castle, and on the left is a chapel. And if you go into that chapel, you see this very ornate structure, and on each column are all these plaques. And on each plaque, you see that little elephant. And each of these plaques is given to somebody who is made into a knight. And of course, most of them are royalties of one kind or another, and they already have their coat of arms and motto. However, every now and then, it's given to somebody who's not a Dane or not a royalty, and they have to make up a new motto and a new coat of arms. So he is, for example, Churchill, Eisenhower, and Mandela, and their plaques. And I don't know about Churchill, but Eisenhower and Mandela certainly have to make up their own um, um, coat of arms and mottos. And in that way, I bring back Neil Spohr again. He once said, the opposite of a profound truth may also be true. To me, that's really just amazing, right? Anyway, he was inducted into the order in 1947, and I was fortunate able to go and take a picture of the plaque over there. And here is what it really looks like. And you see the motto he has chosen, and a coat of army is chosen. And I don't need to tell you what that symbol is. And the uh, motto is, opposites are complementary. So here we are. There is the opposites are complementary. And it is absolutely necessary. It's beneficial. It's ubiquitous. It's essential. And so let's celebrate our collaborative opposition by playing the violin with both hands and playing it with other people and so on and make beautiful music with balance and harmony. And in the same way, let your brain and your heart play together. Okay? And so let me go back to these commandments. This is a New Testament commandment. And the way that I would say it is to love others with open mind and open heart. And here is the Old Testament uh, commandment. Uh, from Deuteronomy, and I would replace that with love the whole world with open mind and open heart. So bridging the science and, division, uh, science and spirituality divide like our two hands, our soulmates, uh, other fellow travelers on the planet, other stars in the galaxy, other galaxies in our universe. Let us celebrate all these divides and let us celebrate the diversity and sing together Blue Boat Home. Thank you very much.
<laughs> I think uh, John would John John would like us to sit down uh, so that he can entertain you some more. But in closing, in closing, uh, I've written a few words in the style of the uh, Irish blessing: "May the road rise up to meet you." Um, I, should, I forgot to thank Doug for all his execution. Are you going to give me an Irish landscape? <laughs> anyway, uh, may, your may your mind blossom with curiosity and acumen. May your spirits be uplifted by awe, wonder, and serenity. May you have exhilarating encounters with strangers and transform them into soulmates. May you discover fresh treasures on the path, on both the internal and the external paths. May you cultivate deep insights into the world that embraces you and the core that is the real you. May your future be blessed with abundant collaborative opportunities, opposition, enabling you to nurture balance and promote harmony in beloved communities in this blue boat home. Thank you. We're going to play, we played a, a Brahms thing at, at Royce's request. We played also a Bach thing, and this is a little piece for two mandolins by Telemann. Let's we'll see if we get through it. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Bye, all. Just want to play something? No, I think it's. I want to play a sound. Just name it. Just name it. Just name it. Play a sound. Let's play. Let's play. Um, come down front.